Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is the 11th episode of a topic we've uh, found very interesting. The topic is heaven. And we're using this book written by Randy Alcorn as our kind of outline to discuss the topic of heaven. So if you haven't seen the first 10 episodes, <laughs> it's a total of 20 hours we've already talked about heaven, uh, then they're available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, so I suggest uh, if you find that the subject of heaven is really of great interest to you, start right from the beginning and uh, watch all of them. Uh, when you have a two-hour discussion and then you have you know 10 of them, that's, that's a lot to take on. So don't think you have to uh, you know, take it on all at once. Uh, gradually work your way through it. Um, I like watching some of these old shows that are off the air and you can get them on Netflix now and you can, you can watch like six seasons uh, and you can do like marathons and watch it over the period of like one week and get through six seasons. It's, it's a fun way to watch something for me. So maybe you can take on a marathon and, and watch this whole series from the beginning if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, let me start off by uh, having the panelists uh, introduce themselves. We'll start with Brother Eric. Hey guys, Brother Eric here. Jesus Knight 72 is my YouTube channel and here and excited to talk about heaven again. Yes. Okay, thank you for joining us, Eric. I don't have my uh, special my effects set up yet, so I'll applause for you in a minute here. Let's go to Brother Jackson. <laughs> yeah, let's applaud for him in real life. Here, real thank you, applause. thank you. Please, please. Idea. That's oh, the old fashioned way. Know. Did you just publicly acknowledge that those aren't real applauses? That <laughs> well, I'm gonna have to. I think pretty much pretty that. much figure that out. <laughs> I gotta go back and delete that now because now they'll be on to us. <laughs> okay, brother Jackson. Hey everyone, I'm Jackson here. Uh, my YouTube channel is Mecha Wing Zero, of which the original airing of the last show took place aboard that starship, and. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and I'm really excited to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. Me too. Amen. And we got Brother Mitch. Hello, everybody. Brother Mitch, happy to visit a uh, little, little glimpse of heaven every week. <laughs> okay. Uh, let, let me all begin by uh, pulling away from the screen and asking you to look at my shirt as uh, Brother Jackson told me, I ought to start wearing some Christian shirts for the show. So let me back off and tell me if you can read this. Is that clear? <laughs> Salvation 33. Salvation EST, established. Established 33 AD. Oh, let me put on my glasses. Oh, There's a mustard stain right there. On it. <laughs> Salvation. You got Have you eaten a hot dog before? What's that? As long as you got the faith of that mustard, <laughs> you'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's um, symbolic, the mustard stain. <laughs> well, first, first of all, before we get into heaven, you know, the question is, is this shirt technically correct or not? Was salvation established 33 AD? Is that the correct year? Well, it was, uh, the task was completed possibly no, 33 it wasn't, AD. It but... wasn't the correct year, though, because the, 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 the calendar is a, t a tad off, and it was actually yeah. 4 AD when... Um, when Christ yeah. Was. yeah, something around there, something either yeah. three or four so, or AD or something to that effect. We, we, we know that Jesus was 33 years old at the time of the crucifixion, and so was, uh, salvation was established at the cross. So people think that that must be 33 AD because we base the calendar on his, his life and death, but uh, it's not exactly right. It has to be adjusted to really 4 BC, which makes his real... Uh, a date of his crucifixion, most people think that yeah, was 30 AD, not 33 AD. Okay, that was just an, like an inter interesting trivia fact. Um, okay, we're going to continue this topic of uh, heaven. And let me see, right now I think we're beginning chapter 12. That would be page 119 in Randy Alcorn's book. Let's start off by reading a quote by... Anthony Hokima, he's been uh, cited numerous times in Randy Alcorn's book already. Uh, the question that, of this chapter is, um, why does all creation await our resurrection? And 
uh, Anthony Kima is quoted as saying, the kingdom of God does not mean merely the salvation of certain individuals, nor even the salvation of a chosen group of people. It means nothing less than the complete renewal of the entire cosmos, culminating in the new heaven and the new earth. Yeah, uh, we, we've said it so many times, it's redundant, but uh, this premise is lost on the church today. <laughs> Go to very any church in America and, uh, silence. Home, and very few members of the church are familiar with this whole concept that there's mm -hmm. going to be uh, our eternity, once we're saved, our eternity is not going to be off in space. It's going to be right here on Earth, the recreated, renewed Earth. What do you say, Mitch? I thought Mitch said something. Okay, so here we'll continue in the book. It says, the gospel is far greater than most of us imagine. That's, uh, I underlined that because I thought that was so profound. Um, it, it isn't just good news for us, it's good news for animals, plants, stars, and planets. It's good news for the sky above and the earth below. Albert Walters says, quote, the redemption in Jesus Christ means the restoration of an original good creation, unquote. Um, maybe this is more significant to me than it would be for many people because uh, the, I, this first sentence says, the gospel is far greater than most of us imagine. Okay? Uh, the gospel. I mean, even agreeing on what the gospel is, is there such a debate as to what is the gospel? Uh, and are, are, there, are there numerous gospels? And does the gospel encompass a much more broader subject than simply one verse? Uh, and now he's expanding this and saying, no, the gospel really applies to all of creation. So what do you think of that? I can't hear anybody. I lost, I lost audio. Uh-oh. I think we would have I to. I lost all audio. I can't, can't hear. Okay. Uh, we heard you, Mitch. Uh, we heard you, so I don't know why he lost his audio. Let me see. Let me see if it's here. Hi, Kabraka. Oh, mute. Talk now, Mitch. Tell me if you can hear me. No, I ended up muting his mic is off now, so. Okay. I was experiencing technical difficulties. Yeah. Now I've got him muted on my side. I didn't mean to, I was I thought I had him muted, but okay, something he's got to do on his side. I don't know what it is, but uh, but I I have him still muted. Man, I, I hope I can unmute him here. Uh, maybe we should just eject him and have him come back. And Mitch, can you hear me? Mitch, uh, I'm going to ask you to join the show again. Start all over from the beginning. Okay? All right. Okay, Eric, you're still there? Yes, sir. All right, Eric and Jackson, what do you uh, think of this point? The gospel is far greater than most of us imagine. Well, I think I think the message there is is clear, and we and we've been talking about it, like you said, for quite some time. Which is the gospel, the 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 power in what Christ did for us at the cross. I mean, it encompasses so much more than just human beings. It, it's it's everything God has created, and that speaks to the power of the act itself. Again, I mean that it's so much. People tend to limit that act to to just people as individuals, and they just consider us. But like you said, you know, you talk about a renewed heavens, a renewed earth, them joined, and that being eternity, the rest of the universe renewed. Um, it, to me, it speaks volumes to the power of that act. Mm -hmm. Well, I think if we think of the the uh, the use of the word gospel. Uh, strictly based upon interpreting what the, the word means, which is good news. Uh, yeah, that's good. We got Mitch up here a second time now. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I can hear you. Okay, I got you on two computers. Oh, okay, well, let me. Uh, why don't you eject the, the first one? Get rid of that so that. Uh, but your you're no vo video's on the first one. You've got to close that out because you won't have video on the second one until you close that one out. 
Well, the thing is, is that I don't have video on the other computer, and I don't have oh. audio on this one. Oh, okay. Well, just this will be fine then. Uh, um, all right. So the word gospel, literal, the literal translation is simply good news. Now, some people say when you use the word gospel as good news, then then you're it's not the right um, way of approaching this because the gospel is said. The apostle Paul says the gospel is such and such. Christ died for his sins. He was buried. Mm -hmm. He was raised from the dead the third day. Right. So this is this is the thing that most people think as the definition of the gospel. Right. And yet, and yet when we think of the good news, uh, we think that all the things that we learn about Jesus uh, is, is part of the good news. That that he has this free gift for us. He'll give us eternal life. Uh, that, that God loves us so much. He came became a man and died for us. All these things are part of the explanation of what the good news is. And Randy's expanded to say, no, the good news even would be should be expanded to the universe right. is going to be uh, recreated too. The gospel saves the universe. Uh, where does he get that? Does he have any verses that he thinks prove that? Well, he's he's not saying it in those words. So let me not put words in his mouth. He says the gospel is far greater than most of us imagine. So when he says the gospel, uh, I'm I'm just coming to the conclusion that he's using the word gospel in the, according to how we translate the word, the good news, because uh, the the gospel itself is just is talking about uh, Christ died for our sins, he was buried, he rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, is that what you think he's referring to that affects all of creation? Or could he be using the word gospel uh, in the broader sense that I just said, that the fact that this is the good news about Jesus? I think it's a long encompassing though. I, I think, yeah, I think, like I said, with what I originally said, it, it salvation... You know, it's the it, it's ultimately when when eternity begins, it's the eradicating of sin, and sin has infected everything, us, the creation itself, everything. So the act of what was completed in the gospel, the death, the burial, resurrection of Christ, to save us is not just saving us; it's saving all of creation eventually. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you you agree then that you could, that statement he made is is. Uh, uh, a fair use of the word gospel. The gospel is far greater sure. than most of us imagine, okay? I think so. Okay. Um, he goes on to say, uh, broadening our view of redemption. Many of us have come to think of redemption far too narrowly. That's why we're fooled into thinking that heaven must be fundamentally different from earth, because in our minds, uh, earth is bad, irredeemable, beyond hope, However, quote, the teaching that the new creation involves a radically new beginning, unquote, writes theologian Cornelius Venema, uh, would suggest that sin and evil have become so much a part of the substance of the present created order that it is unrelievedly and radically evil. It would even simply, it would even imply that the sinful rebellion of the creation had so ruined God's handiwork as to make it irretrievably wicked. Hey guys, I just want to say hi. How you guys are doing? Oh hey, yeah, Austin. Austin. I'm sorry. We uh, when you joined us, we were dealing with a technical problem with with Mitch. You see that he's cloned himself. I I understand. <laughs> Welcome to the show, brother Austin. Glad you could it's make it. Amazing abilities on this show. Okay. Um, all right, so um, in other words, do you, do you think he's correct that the people think of the worth as being like unredeemable? It's just, it's just evil, it has to just be destroyed, whereas we know from our studies in the scriptures and in the, Randy's book that the earth does get redeemed, uh, 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 not only man. I think that most people just don't really have a have a, a real good grasp or don't think about it as much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do believe pe that people have that take. I think that is exactly their take that many people have, that there is no use for the earth. God sees no use for the earth at all anymore in his plan, and that's not true. Any more than it is for the nation of Israel. They try to say the same thing about Israel. No, God has no more use for the nation of Israel. They do the same thing with a lot of things in Scripture that God says uh, is going to be brought back, is going to be redeemed, and never be taken away. Yeah. Uh, it, I guess you could apply the same kind of logic to the idea that the people think that, well, uh, you know, uh, 
our bodies are not going to be redeemed. We're just going to be spirits in heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, the earth is not going to be redeemed. It's just we're just going to live in heaven. The earth has nothing to do with it anymore. So these are some common misconceptions about the redemption. Uh, Randy Alcorn says, but let's not forget that God called the original earth, quote, very good, unquote. The true earth as he designed it to be. That's Genesis 131. The breadth and depth of Christ's redemptive work will escape us as long as we think it is limited to humanity. In Colossians uh, 1, 16 through 20, could you look that up, Eric? Colossians 1, 16 through 20. Sure. Notice that God highlights his plan for the church, but then goes beyond it, emphasizing, quote, all things, everything, things on earth, things in heaven, unquote. Let's read those verses there. Colossians. Sure. Colossians 1, 16 through 20 states, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Mm -hmm. What was the last part of that verse? It no. says, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Uh, but be reconciled, did it say before that? Uh, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. Okay, see, that's the, that's the key point there. Exactly. By the cross... All, the, all of these things, all of creation is reconciled. Yes. So uh, I think Randy is, uh, you know, pointed to a really good verse to support this premise. I mean, the, the way the way I look at it is really very simple. And I don't you know if maybe Mitch and Austin and, and Jackson want to interject here too. It's really very simple. If God sees us as redeemable and, and savable, then why would the rest of the earth be irredeemable and unsavable? It doesn't make sense. It's it's if if we are part of the creation and we're redeemable, why not? Why isn't the earth not? Well, we're, actually, we're going to become like this energy field, this like energy dust. We're going to float around in space and <laughs> Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, I I question the premise of the earth ever being perfect. Uh, why? You, you think it was not perfect? Uh, uh, he said it's very good, and when God says good, uh, that really is, I think, interchangeable with perfect. And Jesus says no one is good but God. Right. And man thinks the word good is a relative term, like uh, I'm pretty good and, and Jackson is really good. But no, there's no, no degrees of goodness. Goodness means perfect. Goodness is pure perfection. I, I, say, it was, uh, I say it was perfect when it was first made. Absolutely. Because there were no perfect. factors. There were no factors against it. There's, you know, everything. The water was fresh. The air was clean. The yeah. everything was good. Yeah. So I agree. Yeah. I'm in Absolutely. Yeah. So. But, or, but on top of that, how it its condition now is not perfect. Yeah. Uh, right. Well, let me, but, I want to get Jackson's reasoning behind that, but first let me ask Mitch something. Mitch, uh, when, when you talk. Um, Instead of your video coming up or your face talking on the screen, just the eye, your picture shows up because of the way you're doing it. I think it, if we'll do it this way if you want to leave it this way, but I think the best thing is for you to close out both of these and just come back on on your original computer and just and do it that way. I think that would probably work. I could I could try it. The, I, the thing is is that um, I tried to come back again uh -huh. with, um, um, with this computer that has the camera on it, and it wouldn't let me. It just gave me no sound, so I tried it once, so I went back over this computer. Oh, okay. All right. Well, this is fine. I'll, I'll, I'll try. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, Jackson, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, uh, why, you, why you made that statement? Well, I guess I don't see very good as having to do with perfection in this sense. I think like we could still say today in our fallen world and everything that the mountains are very good. There is very good design in a bird or, or a mammal or reptile or whatever animal. The design is still very good. 
I don't. I I never have taken that in Genesis to mean and and God saw that it was perfect and that there was no death or something like that. Yeah. Well, we probably could uh, search and find some other verses to support the idea that it was perfect. I think, but off the top of my head, I can't really make the point. So. All right. Let's go on. It says the breadth and depth. Uh, Mitch, uh, you. Oh, he's. Let me close this one here. I'm going to eject that one. At least our technical difficulty isn't as bad as last time. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, okay, I'll continue reading here. The breadth and depth of Christ's redemptive work will escape us as long as we think it is limited to humanity. Oh, we read that. I'm sorry. We read the Colossians. Right, the Colossians verse, right? Okay. Uh, for by him... All things created. Oh, he's got the verse on that page. Okay. Uh, God was pleased to reconcile himself all things on earth and in heaven. The Greek word for all things is tapenta, uh, that are extremely broad in their scope. So um, he's not uh, he's making the point that I made that good means perfect. He's making the point that this it applies to all things. All things in original creation were very good. Um, Eugene Peterson captures the universal implications of Christ's redemption when he paraphrases Colossians 1.18.20 in the message. It goes, he was supreme in the beginning in leading the resurrection parade. He is supreme in the end. Uh, from beginning to end, he's there, towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so roomy that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and dislocated pieces of the universe, people and things, animals and atoms, get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies, all because of his death, his blood that poured out down from the cross. I want to think about these paraphrases. Uh, is there anybody who objects to the use of paraphrases? As long as to not as long as there isn't too much liberty with the paraphrase, I mean, you don't you don't want a paraphrase to become to change the entire meaning of what's being said. Yeah. Being um, careful with paraphrases as as good um, good rule set versus right. including paraphrases are two different things. So now now yeah. what what he's saying here as far as par he's kind of going line by line, kind of paraphrasing what the Colossians verses say in eighteen through twenty. And really, there's nothing wrong with what is said here that, that I noticed. I mean, everything he's saying makes there, – there's nothing that is used to take the attention away from Christ's death, his blood that is shed on the cross, um, and, and what it meant for the blood being shed. So I, I, don't, see any, I don't see anything in what was said there to, to discount that or discredit it in any way or change the, change the total meaning of what's being said. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I like paraphrases. But, but I, I don't put as much weight in a paraphrase as I do a translation. Um, I look at a paraphrase as, uh, let's, say, let's say that you read a verse of Scripture, and then you said, I said to you, put, Eric, put that in your own words. Right. And when we read a paraphrase, that's just a man or a committee of people taking the Scriptures and then kind of putting it in their own words to try to make it understandable, kind of the way we would do it just – on the show, uh, talking about a scripture, mm -hmm. but it, but a paraphrase is not scripture. But you know, sometimes the people, the way they re-explain the scripture, can be helpful. Sure. Okay. Um, the power of Christ's resurrection is enough not only to remake us, but also to remake every inch of the universe: mountains, rivers, plants, animals, stars, nebulae, quasars, and galaxies. Christ's redemptive work extends resurrection to the far reaches of the universe. This is a stunning affirmation of God's greatness. It should move our hearts to wonder and praise. Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, you know, it, it, it's easy to get excited about when you think not only uh, that the, the whole universe will be restored and rebuilt. Uh, that's probably Mitch call. Let's see what he's saying. Yeah. Hello, brother. Hello. Yeah. Well, I, apparently you ejected me off the program. 
Uh, well, I, I d ejected the one that was on your second computer there, so that. Uh, when I went to both of them, both, now both of them ejected. Oh, can you can't get back on? Nope. Oh man, jeez, I no. thought that was just ejecting you off, and that you can get back on. Man, what can we We're do? We're sending him the link again. Uh, uh, well, we'll send you the link. I don't know if you know, I can get back on. You could try. Send me another link. Yeah, okay. Uh, we'll just send you the link. Eric's sending it to you right now in your email, okay? Bye. Uh, Gosh. Dang, Brother Luke, you're already kicking him off. Yeah. <laughs> I was just trying to get a second one off so that we wouldn't have the, the duplication there. Is this Bible talk with Brother Luke, or is this technical difficulty with Brother Luke? <laughs> All right, Jackson. <laughs> that, Jackson, Jackson, was, was that an attempt at humor? <laughs> yeah, it was an attempt. Okay. I'm so what? God, I hope he, I hope he's not ejected from this show. Maybe, All maybe right. I'm ejected from all shows for life. You uh, never I know. That. Do you have? I, I don't have his email. Do you, do you? Certainly, if you ban people, you can unban them, though, right? Like, yeah, if you I would them. think so. Sure, you could unblock them. You, I don't yeah. think he blocked the person. He just simply, I think, no, he just it asked me if it asked, from, me if it asked me if I wanted to block him, and I said no, just to right. uh, right. reject him. Right, right. Yeah, he should be okay. okay. He's, so, Jackson, did you send him the link? Uh, no, I can do so if you want, though. Well, that's, want that, that's what he's waiting for. I'll, I'll do it right now. Uh, okay. Where, just to his YouTube inbox? Or? No, I'm going to send it right to his email. Oh, okay. I'm not sure what his email is. but. Well, you don't want to give that out to the world. You know, This could be exactly. very private. Yeah. Exactly. This, this is a... Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Mitch... Mitch. Okay. All right, send it to him. Man, that's. Oh, they're going to have to fast forward a little way. I, I, try, I try so hard to get Mitch on because of schedule, so when he can, and then I end up kicking him off. Okay. Um, it, he says, All creation waits in eager expectation. Um, do you ever sense creation's restlessness? Do you hear groaning in the cold night wind? Do you feel the forest loneliness, the ocean's agitation? Do you hear longing on the cries of whales? Uh, do you see blood and pain in the eyes of wild animals or the mixture of pleasure and pain in the eyes of your pets? Despite vestiges of beauty and joy, something on this earth is terribly wrong. Not only God's uh, creatures uh, but even inanimate objects seem to feel it. But there's also hope, visible in springtime after a hard winter. As Martin Luther put it, quote, Our Lord has written the promise of the resurrection, not in books alone, but in every leaf in springtime. The, unquote. The creation hopes for, even anticipates, resurrection. That's exactly what Scripture tells us. Huh. Okay, did everybody hear that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. It says the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we eagerly wait, uh, e wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 19 through 23. So uh, he seems to feel that groaning, and he cites it. Uh, has anybody experienced that? Absolutely, I, I think. I think everything we every time we see the Earth you know, doing some of the um, 
you see some of the, a lot of the natural disasters, a lot of the things that are that are happening. It seems they they create, and Christ describes this. In fact, when he when he mentions the end times, he says that things are going to increase like. Like um like pains of a woman in childbearing, you know she's the 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 labor pains are going to keep coming and get harder and worse and worse. And he he equates this ex precisely to mm -hmm. events happening on the earth as um, natural disasters and things like that, earthquakes. Uh, uh, Eric, do you do you think that also um flows into people's personal lives too? As far as what do you mean? How so? In other words, in other words, all these people have all kinds of personal problems. Oh, oh sure, absolutely. That, that, I think it seems like a hundred years ago they didn't have as many. If that makes sense. Oh, sure, absolutely. I think I think you're seeing all that. Well, what else did Christ told us at that time? The love of many would wax cold in those days. It, 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 you know, people in general, their general love of other of mankind of of each other is just going to. It's going to fail. It's going to. People aren't going to be as loving, uh, even as they were in the past. Now, it's never yeah. been flawless loving, right. but it's going to be even worse towards the end. And we see that every day with uh, uh, abortion, the, what people are doing to each other. I mean, this isn't all these things. Well, this, this is what you. Do. This whole tolerance thing seems kind of like a fraud facade to me. For hate. I agree. Hate I agree. One another is really I what agree. it But uh, you know, at Jackson, that's a great. That's a great point, actually. I, I totally agree. You know, people always talk about tolerance and all this, and, and in reality, people couldn't care less about each other. These are the same people who preach tolerance. They don't care about everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, their way or the highway. Exactly. Exactly. I yeah. just one thing uh, I noticed is uh, I know it's somewhere in the. I think it was Elijah when he prayed for no rain. But I also know that droughts are. Uh, you know, a sign of judgment, and there's been a lot of droughts lately in the you know, United States. The past few years, but even this year alone, there's California's even in a huge drought right now. We've seen a lot of those. We've seen a lot of the, the mass animal deaths. Um, oh, yeah. A lot more of those recently. Um, more more um, earthquakes and things like that, increasing in frequency if you pay attention to them. Yeah. Um, it's... And, and this, is all, this is all part of that. So the, the answer to that question, Luke, is I think... Is is easily you see this happening. You see you see um, natural disasters that just on unprecedented scales now. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. is all part of that creation groaning. Yeah. Yeah, I've uh, I don't know. I I feel these kind of groaning feelings sometimes. I don't know if it's it's related to what we're talking about or not, but but sometimes I just feel. Uh, like, like desperate for this redemption, you know, <laughs> this, this oh. glorified body and get it to get into eternity. Oh, you're not, you're not alone. <laughs> okay, uh, the quote redemption of our bodies quote, unquote refers to the resurrection of the dead. Paul says that not only we, but quote the whole creation awaits the earth-wide deliverance that will come with our bodily resurrection. Not only mankind in general, but believers in particular. Those with God's spirit within are aligned with the rest of creation, which intuitively reaches out to God for deliverance. We know what God intended for mankind and the earth, and therefore we have an object for our longing. We groan for what creation groans for, redemption. God subjected the whole creation to frustration by putting the curse not only on mankind, but also on the earth. Um, we, uh, Eric, look up Genesis 3.17, please. Sure. Because human beings and the earth are inseparably linked, and as together we fell, together we shall rise, God will transform the fallen human race into a renewed human race and uh, the present earth into the new earth. Okay, Genesis 3.17 says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, it's... Uh, um, a lot of people are not aware that this, when man fell, all of creation fell, so... It, it, it's not, this is not just some simple thing that affected man and and a death and hell and heaven. You know, it's it's much broader than that. Well, and now those those same elements that were originally created for us are now turning and coming up against us because yeah. of what we did. Yeah, exactly.
I'm trying to find uh, call Mitch here because I what I did was I resent an invitation but you'll have to go to Google Plus to do it you know because it, it's um, one seven three two five oh three one seven two oh yeah, hopefully this will work because I just started from scratch and send the invitation out like at the beginning of the show again. Hello. Hey, uh, I resent an invitation to your Google Plus page like like we're starting the show here. So so maybe it, yeah, that'll work for you. Go to your Google Plus page and look at the, the bell on the right top right and it says notifications and it should tell you if you want to join the show. Tell me. Yeah, I, I think I tried it. Look, I'll try again. Yeah, I just sent it. I sent it to you, a new one. So maybe that'll work. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll give it a try. Okay. Bye. Oh boy. Right. Well, while, while we're dealing with technical difficulties, could everybody check their volume? Because I'm catching like my voice in somebody else's computer. <laughs> I can hear it like echoing. Yeah, there is a little bit of an echo going on. So I don't know where it's coming from. I check my. Awesome. I got, that's why I got my headset on. Check yours. There, there we go. Whatever it was, that's gone. Okay, very good. <laughs> okay, um, what does it mean that creation waits for God's children to be revealed? Our creator, the master artist, will put us on display to a wide-eyed universe. Our revelation will be an unveiling, and we will be seen as what we are, as what we were intended to be, God's image bearers. We will glorify him by ruling over the physical universe with creativity and camaraderie, showing respect and benevolence for all we rule. We will be revealed at our resurrection when our adoption will be finalized and our bodies redeemed. We will be fully human with righteous spirits and incorruptible bodies. That sounds really exciting to me, to, that we're going to be revealed as God's image, image bearers. Uh, yeah, it, it, that really puts the importance uh, on us. Uh, as much as I'm in awe of all of creation, I'm, I'm really in awe of the fact that God loves us so much. seems like he loves us above all everything else, and that uh, we're like his masterpiece, and uh, he wants to... Uh, he's going to put us in charge of everything. It's amazing. Were uh, were angels created before the uh, the earth? Um, before the earth? Um, well, yeah, no, man, that was a stu that was a stupid question because we know Lucifer fell from, or we know Lucifer had his falling out with the Lord for them. Okay, never mind. I knew that. I, mm -hmm. uh, is there anywhere in scriptures that says that though, or anything about the angels? Because there's really there's not a whole lot to tell you about. Um, we know that there we know that there's a fight going on and there's war for souls and everything, but before not regarding the uh, the, the current war, there's not really like a description or what they act. Well, like I, else. without without trying to be able to prove the point here, because I don't have the the information really uh, um, in my memory bank here to draw it out, but uh, it always confused me about this uh, Satan being cast out from heaven. The way I understand it now is that uh, he's cast out twice. First, he's cast out into uh, the air. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he still, he still uh, can't, uh, came to heaven. I'm mean, like when he was uh, tempting Job. He was up there as the accuser of Job. Uh, he could still go to heaven, but then when he's cast down uh, in this in Revelation, when he's cast down. He's cast down. He no longer has any even access to 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 heaven, and that's a future event. Right. But again, I'm talking off the top of my head without anything to back that up right now. So, okay, as mankind goes, so goes creation. John Calvin writes in his commentary on Romans 8:19, "Quote: I understand the passage to have this meaning: that there is no element and no part of the world." which is being uh, touched, as it were, with a sense of its present misery that does not intensely hope for a resurrection. 
Hmm. I'm not, I don't know. There's no element, no part of the world there's not hope. I don't know. I, that might be a reach for me to think that inanimate matter is hoping for resurrection. What do yeah, you think? I can't, I can't quite um, agree with that because inanimate matter doesn't think the way we do and everything. And how can you yeah. hope for something if you don't think? Would uh, would yeah. this be like considering like trees and stuff? Yeah. Uh, well, I know that the Native Americans felt that way. They, you know, they would say the land is crying out for peace, or the land is mourning for sorrow. So well, I, I, I mean, not not the not mother goddess worship or anything like that, but I mean, in a sense, that maybe that's what he's trying to get at. Well, he, I think he's getting this from this Romans uh, thing that we read earlier. Eric, could you look this up? Because uh, I don't know what translation you use, but sure. look this up. Romans eight nineteen through twenty three. And it's talking about the, uh, how the whole creation has been groaning. So maybe this is how he's basing what he's basing it on. Well, and I think and let me just say I, I'm going to say something. I don't know the answer to this necessarily, but um, to me, it's like here's where there's kind of a little bit of an allegory kind of going on with this. Obviously, inanimate objects don't think and 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 you know, are aware like we are, so they aren't. So you have to kind of give that a little bit to say that I think it's by their nature and the way they were created, they desire. To function, they are supposed to function in a certain way, and they long to function in a way that they're not functioning. You know, they every does that make sense to you guys? It's like they, as people, we think of it as a thought we desire to do it, but inanimate objects like trees, things like that, they 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 by their design they wish to function in a certain way, but they don't function that the proper way. So that's the desire of wanting to function in the proper way. Mm -hmm. Um the the gen the um the Romans verse you looked up you wanted to look up was uh <clears throat> you said it was eight nineteen through twenty three. Uh eight nineteen through twenty three. Yeah. Um for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, like you talked about, Luke, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. We groan, we long for that. We want to get our redeemed bodies. We want to be through with this. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think that to take that uh, the uh, creation is not what it's supposed to be, and it's out of, out of kilter somehow, and it, or it desires it, if if not thinking right. the way we do, right. but it's off, and it needs to be corrected. Yeah. And that's kind of the best way they could put it. They're they're kind of putting giving giving human like attributes to something that's not human. They're they're kind of they're just kind of saying it, it the creation itself, because it rises up the way it does, it's doing the unnatural things that it's doing. And we're seeing the earth do the things it's doing. It's because the earth itself, the trees, the the ocean, everything about it God creates these things to function in a way and because the des the design has been screwed up, it, mm -hmm. it can't function the way it wants to. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so it goes on, uh, what is, quote, the whole creation, unquote, that groans for our resurrection? The phrase appears to be completely inclusive of, quote, the heavens and the earth, unquote, that God created in the beginning, Genesis 1-1. So it is the heavens and the earth that eagerly awaits our resurrection. This includes earth and everything on it as well as the planets of our solar system and the far reaches of our galaxy and beyond. If it was created, Paul includes it in the whole creation. It's, it's hard for really for us to really even like, grasp this and comprehend it, the, the real, uh, um, what that really means and con includes. Uh, but when he says the whole creation groans, that's, uh, that means everything. That means all of creation. <laughs> yeah, I have a I have a theory here, and maybe people won't agree with it. And this is why people say they have a hard time kind of thinking. Well, how does that pertain to like we talked about earlier in the book you were, you were reading? How's that pertain? How could that pertain to stars and other galaxies and things like that? 
And if you take, if you consider the beginning and God's creation, and God's presence at that time, He dwelt with creation. He dwelt with it at that time that it was created. Mm -hmm. Now, when sin came in and rebellion came in, that was the one item that changed. His presence had to retreat, and it, it was as if his presence alone in the creation sustained it. It, it. it kept it living. It kept it breathing. And once his presence had to pull away from that because of sin, everything began to fall apart. So stars began to die. Things began to move out of place. I mean, it says a lot about the power of God and how he really is all-powerful. And, yeah. and, I mean, his very presence, his very presence holds these things together. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, I could uh, relate to that as like the presence. In other words, let's compare God to the sun for a moment. Not that I'm a sun worshiper that, or so that kind of a thing, but uh, <laughs> uh, the sun, when its presence is taken away or the rays of the sun, plants and stuff are going to die without it, and it's just not right. going to be able to. But when the, the sun's rays are on it, then they can be healthy and thrive. And so maybe God has some kind of radiant glory on the universe mm -hmm. that is not uh, that, that is lacking. Interesting. Okay. Um, here's a quote by C.S. Lewis. It says, "Though the witch knew the deep magic, there is a magic deeper still which she did not know. Her knowledge goes back only to the dawn of time." But if she could have looked a little further back into the stillness and the darkness before time dawned, she would have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would start working backwards. Wow. Yeah, I remember that. I remember exactly what that's talking about in that book. Mm hmm yeah, he doesn't say what book it's from. It just says C.S. Lewis, Lion. so I don't know what book it, he wrote it in. It's the Lion, the Witch, and the Witch Wardrobe. Witch and the Wardrobe, right. He's talking about Aslan when Aslan offers himself, the Lion. The Lion was the symbol of Christ. His stories were all geared toward Christianity in a symbolic way. Aslan was yeah. the symbol of Christ. He died for, for them. Yes, and that Lion... Uh, uh, obviously, there's a lot of people who watch that would not understand that it's a Christian story of Christianity. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but the lion, the lion is, uh, I think, represents Jesus as being the lion of the tribe mm -hmm. of Judah. Absolutely. That's another name for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what possible effect could our redemption have on galaxies that are billions of light years away? The same effect that our fall had on them. Adam and Eve's sin did not merely create a personal catastrophe or a local Edenic, Eden, Edenic <laughs> catastrophe. It was a catastrophe of cosmic, not just global proportions. Yeah. So, you know, we, we're, this is really emphasizing how vast the fall was and conversely how, how vast the redemption will, will be. Um, Randy Alcorn says, Astronomy has been my hobby since childhood. Years before I came to know Christ, I was fascinated by the violent collisions of galaxies, explosions of stars, and implosions into neutron stars and black holes. The second law of thermodynamics, entropy, tells us that all things deteriorate. This means that everything was once in a better condition than it is now. Children and stars can both be born, but both ultimately become engaged in a downward spiral. Even the remotest parts of the universe reveal vast realms of fiery destruction. On on the one hand, these cataclysms declare God's greatness. On the other hand, they reflect something that is out of order on a massive scale. Things like this really, uh, to me, are such strong proofs of, of uh, God and creation, rather than, you know, uh, just... Uh, atheism and and uh, you know random 
occurrence, uh, uh, Darwinian evolution. Um, the more I, you look at creation, you have to come to the conclusion that this is designed, and it's just. Uh, and I, I think, who was it that said, you know, you 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 want proof of God? Just just look. He's, he's shown you his creation. <laughs> it's, it's pretty. It's very convincing to me. I don't understand why there's some people that are determined not to see it. Well, atheism is kind of baffles me in a sense that you know you, you have so much weighing against you. You know, all these threats. And I, I understand a lot of people don't hear the true gospel, but if they did hear the right one, it's a free gift. And you and if you don't accept this free gift, you're told you're going to go to this place. And you know these people would, would literally say, "I don't believe in it," and they wouldn't take it. You know, just even even if it had to come down to it, they wouldn't even play it safe. They would be like, "Nah, I just don't believe in it." That just that baffles me completely because they don't yeah. know for sure. They don't even know for sure that they're right. So I mean, they just, ah, I don't, I don't care. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna find out. That's crazy. Well, I think I think um a part uh, one ingredient, Austin, that they may not may not uh, want to admit is in there is a, a, a love of self justification so to speak you know they don't have to admit that any of their actions really are very immoral in that way if that's the case you know right yeah hmm. um, okay um, he he says I underline this I guess I thought this was important it says it seems possible that even the second law of thermodynamics, at least as it is properly understood, may have been the product of mankind's fall. If true, it demonstrates the mind-boggling extent of the curse. The most remote galaxy, the most distant quasar, was somehow shaken by mankind's sin. That is really mind-boggling, but you know, when you think of all of creation, the vastness of the universe, and then the vastness of inner space within the, our, 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 I think Eric said, even within our body is another universe. Even within a cell is another universe. It's just, it's amazing. Uh, when you look at it outwardly and inwardly, creation is just mind-boggling. And so, and to think that man's sin, man's rebellion from God, man's I call it, made it in a video, uh, declaration of dependence. Adam and Eve made a declaration of independence. They wanted to be dependent from God. And what we need to do to uh, have a relationship with God is we need to declare our dependence on Him. And, and uh, so when they declared their independence, the, all of the, the universe fell. Adherents of some views of the origin of the universe believe that entropy, such as all things tend toward deterioration and disorder, has always been operative. But we should not look at things as they are now and assume they've always been this way. In 2 Peter uh, 3, verses 4 through 7, could you look that up for me, Eric? Sure. The Bible rejects the uniformitarian view that, quote, the process is acting in the same manner at a present and over long spans of time are sufficient to account for all current uh, features in the universe and all past changes. Uh, we are so accustomed to the cycle of death in nature that we assume it is natural and has always been as it is. The Bible appears to say otherwise. Quote, death came through Adam, um, 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, I see no biblical evidence for the assumption that God designed his creation to fall into death or that animal death predated mankind's fall. Do artists deliberately inject decay into their work? Would an omnipotent artist do so? Both Genesis and Romans 8 suggest otherwise. I am well aware that many will disagree with me on this, but I state it based on my reading, my understanding of Romans 8. So that's right up... Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, Jackson's alley, but let's first read uh, read that verse. Uh, you got that, Eric? Sure, and and I find it fitting uh, to give it to give people a little history on this verse. The verse is actually, if you go back and start beginning uh, to read a little earlier than where it starts at verse four, we're actually talking about the times, you know, the signs of the times towards the end. Here, Peter's talking about, and he's talking about how with the what how people are going to be acting at that time. Verse four says. 
and saying people would be at that time and saying where is the promise of his coming they'd be mocking that Christ hasn't come people would be saying he's coming but people would be saying where is the promise of his coming for since the fathers fell asleep all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation for this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men mm -hmm. I'm not sure I followed the verse and the connection to this you did you get it well I think he's just talking about in general that the, the places where it mentions um, for since the fathers, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. So, um, for this they are willingly ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old. So, if they were, I think he's trying to say if they were put in place that way, um, they didn't stay that way. I, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure how he's equating it with that yeah. um, myself, but well, but, but not, it is. Uh, I'm not knowledgeable enough to really uh, teach on on this, but I I believe that uh, uh, there's the scriptures to support that the the creation, uh, the earth as it existed before uh, Noah, was different than this today. Uh, the Bible says that the first rainfall was what caused the flood. There was no rainfall, um, and it said that the earth was surrounded by the the water of the air which is like a vapor or well, I think there's also a verse I think that says that a mist came up from the ground and watered the yeah uh, yes so uh, um, it seems like there's a lot of people who've studied this and taught a lot on this topic and they say that the they think the ozone layer was different the cl cloud covering of the earth the humidity all these things were different and that's why people could live to be uh, a thousand years, nine hundred years old, uh, because the environment was much more conducive to life. And uh, after the flood, uh, things were changed, and that's when men started uh, having a life expectancy of you know, seventy or eighty. Okay. Hey, Rich, um, I had a quick question. Why is there a significance to three days? You know, when Christ was buried and he rose again for three days. I know that I know that we, well, we always mention that when he came back. Yeah, he came back on the third day, but is there a significance to the number three there? Or, well, was it there symbolic to it? Was well, the the, um, the only significance that I can connect it to uh, is uh, J Jesus said that uh, this will be like Jonah? the like sign Jonah. that he was going to give that he was like Jonah. Okay. Jonah was in, in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, and so shall, shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Gotcha. So um, that's the only thing that I can see that uh, would be uh, you know, related to it. Okay, thank you. Unless we just look at numerology and, and try to look at the significance of the number three. If You, know, you could study it from that viewpoint too. Okay. Uh, Okay, wait a second. Uh, okay, he, he next he says, isn't it reasonable to suppose that the pristine? Well, this is what I was point I was making is, isn't it reasonable to suppose that the pristine conditions of God's original creation were such that humans and animals would not die, uh, stellar energy would be replenished, and the planets would not fall out of orbit? What if God intended that our dominion over the Earth would ultimately extend to, to the entire physical universe? Then uh, we would not be surprised to see the whole creation come under our curse because it would all be under our stewardship. That's an interesting conclusion, isn't it? Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's I think it's entirely, and that's why I brought up the point before when God has created all these galaxies and stars and planets and things like that that we know exist. It's not there's no question. Um, clearly. To me, he, he's showing us through that 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 was his intention all along, but we never got to that point. Um, Jackson always – he always brings up – he says not only things going to be good like they were, but there's going to be upgrades. 
Well, you know, those upgrades, I think, were always going to be in place. Those upgrades were always going to be, he, you know, God started us off on the earth, said, you have all these wonderful things I've created for you. And unknowingly, we didn't realize that it was going to extend beyond the earth, but to other planets and other places and things of that nature. So, you know, that all got put on hold. That all stopped. Yeah. Right. Let me ask something that is, uh, because I, I have a guilty conscience right now, uh, because of what happened with Mitch. Um, I'm thinking I, I would like to give him a phone call and see what if we end this show and then started up another hangout to see like part two of the same show and divide it into two two separate hours and maybe he can get back on the show in the second hour. Uh, do you want me to? Uh, you think I could give that a try? Would is everybody willing to do that? Sure. sure. Yeah. Of course, Mitch Mitch might not might have just gone on with his life and done something else now. I don't know. Well, you could call him before ending this show. Yeah, I'm, I, that's what I'm doing, brother. See this? Yeah. This is a um, old-fashioned phone, but it doesn't have rotors on it. That's old-fashioned. <laughs> oh, I, I really, I really am old. That, that's old-fashioned. <laughs> okay. Hey, okay, this is what we'd like to do if you're uh, still in, uh, uh, willing. Uh, we're going to end the show after one hour and then start a, a second hour, uh, and, and you'll get a new invitation to start from scratch. You, you, would you like to do that? Okay, we're going to end it, and uh, you'll get another invitation. Uh, we'll be starting in a couple minutes. Okay, bye. Yeah, okay, I feel a lot better now. Okay, so I'll stop this broadcast. So if you're watching this, uh, this is going to be... Uh, uh, episode. Uh, <laughs> look, Mike just joined us. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, just, this will, this is episode 11A and 11B is going to start in a minute. Uh, before I do though, Mike, Mike, his his mic might be on mute. Uh, Mike, check to see if your mic is on mute. Uh, point Hello? your cursor. Are you there? Yep. You hear me? Okay. Yeah, Mike. Welcome to the show. You, you came at an unusual time because our shows are two hours long, but Brother Mitch was with us and uh, accidentally he got ejected off the show. I'm going to have to end the show and then I'm going to start a second half of the show in a minute. So you'll get a brand new invitation and we're going to start okay. the second. We're going to start the second hour all over again. So, all uh, right. so everybody, look at your Google Plus page and uh, go to that notification part, and you'll be able to join the second part in a minute. I'll get it all set up. Okay. All righty. <laughs> okay. Thanks.